Happy midweek football week in America. The football night in America family all together here. Mine is Chris Sims, who we only let out on weekends. So that's one of the reasons Chris doesn't join us <laughs> on a regular basis on these deals. Rodney, Tony, Mike Florio, good good to see you all. Not good to get the news that we were getting during the week uh, after the NFL went through Tuesday, Mike, with no positive test. Uh, Wednesday, obviously, that story changed in New England and in Tennessee again and with the Raiders. So th this obviously is something that's going to continue to be part of the story. And, Mike, I guess, Tony, Rodney, let's start the conversation with – what are we looking at here long term with the NFL if we get to the reality that teams are going to miss games and not be able to make them up? Well, Mike, you know, I'll start with Tennessee. They've already had their bye week move from week seven to week four to accommodate last week's game being postponed against the Pittsburgh Steelers. Now with the Titans unable to get back into their facility on Wednesday as they prepare for the Bills to come to town. That game just can't be moved somewhere else. We're already in a position where the NFL has to tack on a week 18 to the season, move the playoffs back a week, something the NFL has contemplated but didn't want to do this early in the year. But that's what we're already looking at because this outbreak continues in Tennessee. And now we've got a potential outbreak in New England, two of the 32 teams so far. And look, as the numbers go up across the country, and as guys continue to go home every single night, you're going to have this ever-present possibility, number one, of infection at home, and then number two, outbreak, whether it's in the facility, on the sideline, in the plane, on the bus, or on the field during games. Yeah, I don't think there's any question about it. Um, you're just going to have to stay flexible, and there are going to be outbreaks. We are going to miss people in certain games, and we may have teams that miss games. So. Uh, I think the NFL has to devise some plan of attack that way, that it's not going to be fair, it's not going to be equal. We're going to have to do the best we can because this is unprecedented circumstances. You know what, Coach, and I also I think the players are going to have to be completely and totally committed to isolating themselves, whether it's away from family, you know, and, and basically – you know, going to work and coming home, not going to the grocery store, getting some, you know, just just being at home isolated. My wife and my daughter caught the virus, and because my daughter brought it home over to, um, to them, and she's a nurse. And it's just like, you know, you give somebody a simple hug, and all of a sudden it could pass. Um, it's just a scary thing. And now you look at the competitive imbalance. You look at what the Patriots had to go through without Cam Newton, what they possibly might have to go through without Stephon Gilmore. Like, you talk about the fans, Mike, being upset. I mean, a lot of coaches, I'm sure, are upset losing their star players. You know, no doubt. Mike and Tariqa and I talk every week to uh, Notre Dame football players and their opponents. And these young men, they're doing everything, Mike. We talk to Ian Book and Sean Crawford, and they say, hey, we go to the facility, we come home. We study over Zoom. Our tutors are over Zoom. I don't go outside. I don't go anywhere. Uh, I'm committed to that. And that, that, as Rodney says, that's the attitude you're going to have to take if you want to be available for 16 weeks. And a lot of the guys are doing that, you know. I mean, it's a reality that there are a lot of players in the league got through all of training camp in the first three weeks of the year. And, Rodney, I, I think you give us, and one, thanks for sharing that, and two, I hope everybody in your family is is okay and continues to do okay. But by you sharing that, it's just a perfect example of you can do everything right, and yet the people who come tangentially in contact with you may spread it. I, I was looking at the deal that's going on in the White House, and we're not going to get political here, but just use this as constructive. In the debate prep for the president, last week were Hope Hicks, who tested positive, Kaylee McEnany, the White House press secretary, Chris Christie, all have tested positive. Also in that room, which sounds like it was a relatively small area, were Rudy Giuliani, Ivanka Trump, Jared Kushner, who to this point have not tested positive. The Tennessee Titans played the Minnesota Vikings on the football field. We're now nine days removed from that. The defensive tackle who tested positive had 48 snaps interacted with the Vikings on the field, the disease didn't pass to anyone on the Minnesota offensive line or anybody on Minnesota. So it's all illustrative of we just don't know. There is no answer. And we have to be very careful. And Mike Florio, this was a, a bit of a behind-the-scenes conversation. Is it an investigation or is the NFL trying to do just recon and find out what's going on in these facilities? You have to be very careful when you start blaming individuals or people for being 
guilty, quote unquote, in this starting of a spread. Sometimes it just happens by accidental contact that they didn't even know about. Yeah, but Mike, that's a very good point. And I've talked to multiple coaches who believe that the league is more inclined to place blame than just say, oh, well, it happened. And the league's attitude mm -hmm. is, if you follow our protocols, everything will be fine, which means if something isn't fine, you must not have followed our protocols. And there's some okay. tension between the teams in the league because there's this belief that the league wants to be able to say, if anything goes sideways, it's not our fault. It's not our protocols. It's your fault mm -hmm. because you didn't follow them properly. Tony Rodney, you guys lived your lives in locker rooms. How would you feel if you're in this situation right now, Rods, where uh, you were Kansas City and here came New England after negative tests, negative tests, everybody who took the field had just been off a negative test. And now you're finding out that, okay, Stefan Gilmore has tested positive. And who knows who else could have been possibly carrying the virus at that point when you played them. H how, do you, how do you get your mind about being, being straight about playing next week and the week after that? It's, it's tough, Mike, because um, yeah. you just don't know. You could do everything. And I, I thought I did everything perfectly since March, isolating, wearing my mask at home, haven't eaten out at a restaurant, you know, just only place I would go is on the golf course. And I, I would be the only person on the golf course with the mask on. So it's, it's tough. And the fact that a lot of these young kids, these young men, they're so big and they're so strong and they feel like they're so healthy. They feel like they're immune to catching this virus. A lot of them, young people, they just don't take it serious. And trust me, after seeing my wife and seeing my daughter go through this situation, it's scary because whether you lose your sense of taste, of smell, um, you know, you sleep for eight hours, but you wake up and you feel like you only had 20 minutes of sleep. These are all the different symptoms that, you know, that your family members, your loved ones are feeling, man, and it's scary. So you think I'm going to trust a 22-year-old guy that's going to come in the locker room and trust that he's going to do the right thing? And, you know, he's, out, he's, he's, he's got money in his pocket. He's used to being out and about and having different people come through. It would be very scary for me in the locker room, Coach. And I, I'll tell you, my son Justin is going through it. His high school here in Tampa, their football team has gotten shut down for the last two weeks. Um, a student tested positive. Well, they're testing everybody else who's been in contact with that student. So far, none of the teammates, none of his teammates have tested positive, but they can't play. They're in isolation. So he's wondering, well, does one of my teammates have it? Have I been in contact with it? And not knowing is just as tough as, well, I shouldn't say it's as tough as having it, but it's really impacted him as the not sure. knowing what is going on. That's fair. Hey, let me ask you one quick question about this. Then I want to move on to some football. So there's a week 18 possible, Mike. You mentioned that there's a week 19, which would be pushing the Super Bowl back. Apparently, there's openings in Tampa to do that. That's just the start of the conversation. The other reality is we may not have everybody play 16 games and go by winning percentage. That's why the commissioner has set up this advisory committee to deal with inequities that normally wouldn't happen in the NFL. Tony, I'll start with you. Then, Rodney and Mike, you can jump in. If we don't play 16, and somebody plays 16, somebody plays 14, we do it on winning percentage. Are you okay with that? I think we're going to have to, and I think we're going to have to be okay with it because the alternative is going to be tough. Do you have teams play Tuesday, Sunday? Uh, that's not fair. Do you have teams play without a, a third of their starting roster? That's not fair. So we're not going to have an equal fair situation. And to me, I think we're going to have to get used to the, the idea of winning percentage is going to be the determinant. I think, I think for me, um, maybe what they should start considering, like you talked about, Mike, shortening the season, and maybe by four games. Maybe, you know, possibility of just saying, hey, the, the, you know, four games we're, we're not going to play. And it, obviously it can be non-divisional games or non-conference games, however they want to set it up. But I, I just think the more football you play, the more guys come into the facility, the more they're around each other, the more you're going to feel – comfortable just to kind of do what you want to do and um and not really you know follow all the protocols and just get too comfortable so if you take away four games which is roughly a month i think that could possibly help them out a little bit florio yeah you know i had two different coaches point out late last week when this first wave flashed and we had titans then patriots and the scare with the saints that ended up just being a false positive play 12 games 
bump things back if you need to, regroup, use the bubble if that's what you have to do. But let's just do 12 games. Everyone played 12 games. One coach yeah. suggested taking away the second pass through the division so you play your division rivals once each and taking away one mm. of the non-conference games to even it out that way. But make sure I – th I think they have to strive to make sure everybody plays the same amount. Those of us who follow it closely – have been wrestling with it long enough to kind of accept the fact that, well, they may have to go by winning percentage. My guess is right. once the average fan starts to get a load of this, they're going to be extremely upset about the idea of missing the playoffs because the team that got in didn't have to play that one extra game that they may have lost, and your team gets in instead. I'll just throw out these couple of things real quick, and then we'll move on. Uh, and again, we're just speculating, which is dangerous, and it's, it's not prudent at times in our business. Maybe ensure that you play all your division games and your division champs go and then winning percentage determines the wild cards. If you end up being able to play all six division games, because that's the purest way to get those four teams in and then the other three are determined by winning percentage. The second part is the bubble that you've talked about, Mike Florio. I think like we're watching in baseball happen right now, they're really going to have to consider a bubble, if not a one or two site bubble for the postseason because it's going to be very difficult to postpone postseason games if you get a positive test here or there. We're a ways away from that. We're going to learn a lot more about how this happens between now and then, but I think those are things to talk about. Uh, Rodney, I'll start with you. There's a change in Houston, the first coaching change of the year, uh, and we're always cognizant of the realities of what a coaching change means. It's families, it's people, it's a, a real business, but it is our job to talk about the football part of it. Bill O'Brien won some divisions in Houston. They did not get off to a good start this year, had the toughest schedule of anybody in the NFL, but at 0-4, he's out. What do you see as that next step, that next chapter in Houston? Well, let's first talk about Bill O'Brien, and I think, you know, the thing that stood out to me when I first got with Coach, he always talked about being a head coach and the responsibility of head coach is not just being able to coach your football team, but it's dealing with all the other different responsibilities that come along, whether it's picking hotels, um, which um, airline you're going to fly, just all the different distractions, and you put that on top of Bill O'Brien trying to be a general manager, which I think he made major mistakes. I mean, who takes on Brandon Cook's contract? Who trades for a, a second-rate um, David Johnson? You know, those type of things. And then you get rid of DeAndre Hopkins. He's the best wide receiver in the National Football League. So, you know, Houston has a great foundation with Deshaun Watson, but to me, they just get to a point where he wasn't continuing to develop. He was just dropping back, using athleticism, and it was really no rhyme or reason the type of offense that they were running. So whoever they bring in as, as the new coach, they need to come in and be able to work with Deshaun Watson and get that offense going. They just have entirely too much talent on that offense for it to be so stagnant. And I'm not a big yeah, fan look, of... Go ahead, Coach. I'm not a big fan of in-season changes. I don't know what it serves you. It doesn't help your team play better. The one thing it may let you do is get a head start on this process. And if the powers that be in Houston are looking and going to do a diligent search, then maybe that's a good reason for it. But other than that, I just don't like the idea of changing coaches. I, I don't think it helps your team at all in midseason. Hmm. I'm just still confused by the whole thing because – they tried to hire Nick Casario to be the GM in June of 2019. That blew up in their faces. They decided to go forward with no GM. Bill O'Brien essentially served as the GM in 2019. And after they won the division, made it to the round of eight, led the Chiefs 24-0 in the divisional round before it all fell apart, as we all know, then they decided to make him the general manager. That, that validated everything that he did. They ratified every decision he made. They make him the GM officially. They get the schedule from hell out of the gates against the Chiefs, the Ravens, and then at the Steelers. They lose to the Vikings. That's the only game they lost they should have won. And now Bill O'Brien's performance as the GM in four games gets Bill O'Brien, the multi-year head coach, fired. It's just odd to me that it happens now because it's – it's not like ownership wasn't, you know, on board with everything that's happened for the last year and a half. And now all of a sudden the guy's got to go. It just really does confuse me about why it happened now. 
Yeah, it's an interesting job with Deshaun Watson. So many people think Deshaun Watson has all that star quality. We've seen it in performance. And it'll be very interesting to watch how the names start to develop there. Is that a place where an Eric Bieniemy, whose name has come up a lot because of his work with Patrick Mahomes and his work with the Kansas City offense, can he bring some of that? I, I just, for the first time that I read that Bill O'Brien was let go, the first thing I thought of was, what if New York upheld the touchdown to Will Fuller? at the end of the game, the replay on Sunday, and they get the two-point conversion, they win in overtime. I know they gave you three what-ifs, but are you telling me that you're going to make, if they win that game, he's not getting fired. So you're telling me that you're making a decision on your head coach after losing to the three best teams, we think, in the AFC, maybe three of the four best teams, no disrespect, Tennessee, and a call that was this close against Minnesota. There obviously were other reasons, but I think if they win that game, he doesn't get fired. Sometimes that's why I'm with you, Tony. I don't understand the in-season changes when it's something not egregious. Uh, but hey guys, games, I, I just have yeah, one question. I have one question. Yeah. Did you guys see the way that defense played? The defense has been playing all year. <laughs> yep. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. a, that's another part of it. They're just not playing hard and physical. They're not playing tough, Mike. Mm -hmm. and, and they've undergone a, a coordinator change. Even though Romeo Crennel was still there, and now he is the interim head coach. Uh, Roddy, I'll come to you. Let's start on this game here this week. Let's give uh, quick thoughts on some of the things we're looking at. Eagles and the Steelers, the Eagles surprised, obviously, all of us since we all picked the 49ers on the show. And don't worry. <laughs> we heard you, Philadelphia. We heard you loud and clear. Oh, we, all picked, we understand too, that. Yes. Oh, they, they, I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't think that last pass fell incomplete before Twitter started lighting up with the Eagles fans for us, right? Uh, and, and here are the Steelers that we talked about, Rod, just uh, hanging and waiting after last week. What are you going to look for in this game? Well, I'm looking forward to just seeing how that Eagles offensive line deals with um, T.J. Watt, Bud Dupree, and all those blitz and zones and, and things, that, all the different um, different calls and just what they do on the defensive side of the ball. And Coach and I, we've talked about this during um, Football Night in America, that they put a lot of pressure on you, but there's a lot of holes in that secondary. Guys take a lot of chances. They're very aggressive. They, you know, they try to create turnover. So if Carson Wentz, and that's what I'm looking for too, can he? Is there a level of consistency in in his play? Will he be able to deal with the the, the defensive line, the pressure, making the right calls? Will Doug Peterson do a better job of getting the ball out of his hands quickly? And also, will they continue to focal uh, focus on their best player, which I think is Miles Sanders offensively? Yeah, and I, I have to give Philadelphia a lot of credit. Carson Wentz played last Sunday night. He played aggressive, and he didn't play reckless. He made some things happen. But I don't think this week that Ben Roethlisberger will throw two balls right to them, just <laughs> like Nick Mullins did. I think Ben Roethlisberger is going to play a lot more like C.J. Beathard played those last couple series. Yeah. yeah, and it's funny. It reminded me of the Steelers quarterback who once threw two balls right to Cowboys Stop defensive it. back Larry Brown in Super Bowl Stop starting, it. right? I mean, <laughs> throw it right to him. They throw it right to him. But, uh, yeah, Ben Roethlisberger better than Neil O'Donnell. And here's the question about the Steelers. I don't know how good they really are because mm -hmm. they've played three games and their opponents are a combined 1-11. and The only team that's won that they've beaten was the Broncos. And all three of those games could have gone either way. Even the Giants game where they were up 16 points in the fourth quarter. There was that long drive in the third quarter and the Bud Dupree hitting Daniel Jones and Cameron mm -hmm. Hayward catching the ball in the end zone. That game could have gone either way, too. So it's not like the Steelers have dominated lesser opponents. So I'm just curious to see what they're going to do now against an Eagles team that's, you know, feeling pretty good about themselves. And to your point, the Broncos won win, the one win out of that group. That only win came against the Jets on Thursday night. The Jets are at probably as bad as any team in the league right now. So I love when you look at games and you're like, oh, I don't know about this game. But all of a sudden, it's very interesting. And that's Indianapolis against Cleveland. Tony, you have uh, talked about at length the lack of defense this year in the National Football League. The one place we've seen it for a month is Indianapolis. What is it about the Colts defense that bears watching as one of the better defensive units in the league? Well, I, I love Matt Eberflus. Uh, he grew up in the league in Dallas under Rod Marinelli. They only play a couple of defenses. They play one front, they play two or three coverages, they play hard, there's nothing fancy. And he says, I'm gonna get good players and I'm gonna turn them loose and let them be athletic. And they hustle to the ball. 
and they try not to give up big plays. And so far, it's been very effective. <clears throat> now, the same thing could be said of them as we talked about the Steelers. They haven't played the, the Aaron Rodgers and the Patrick Mahomes as yet. So we'll, we'll see what's going to happen. But I think they will be sound against the run. Cleveland has dominated people on the ground this year. Uh, I think it's going to be a fun game to watch. Coach, you summed it up because I was watching them this morning and they play hard. Like you talked about, they hustle to the ball. They got a bunch of guys. They don't they don't have a lot of big name guys, yeah. you know, that that's on that defense, but they play hard. They hustle, they hit. And I haven't seen a defense get five, six, seven, eight guys to the ball like these guys get to the ball. And they, they play with a lot of pride. And you look at Kenny Moore, you look at Xavier Rhodes, who was a cast out from the Minnesota Vikings. He's back up there playing with confidence, physical, and actually was the um, I think it was the NFC Defensive Player of the Year last, uh, the NF NFC Defensive Player of the Week last week. So um, yeah, they, they're 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 playing good defense right now. Yeah, you would appreciate this, Rodney. Go ahead, coach. I, let me just interrupt you, Mike. Rodney would appreciate this. Matt Eberflus grades loafs. He got that from Rod Marinelli. Rod, and yeah. that is if if you if you change speed on the film, you get a loaf. <laughs> if you speed up, that means you were not running as fast as you could. If you slow down, obviously, before the, the whistle blew, then you get a loaf. But uh, the first time Rod Marinelli gave Warren Sapp a loaf because he, he said, I ran all the way across the field and made the tackle on Robert Smith 20 yards down the field. No, but you weren't running as hard as you can those first five yards. You were loafing. That's the way Matt Eberflus coaches. Mm -hmm. I love it. And Xavier love Rhodes, it. if he played last year in Minnesota the way he's playing this year, they wouldn't have cut him. They would have happily paid that salary and kept him around. He's been great. And that trade for DeForest Buckner, you know, the Colts knew how screwy this draft was going to be, how uncertain it was going to be without the full and complete opportunity to scout players. They were happy to give up the first-round pick to get DeForest Buckner and pay him, and it's paid off. And that defense really is stepping up in a year with no defense. The Colts are this throwback unit, and it'll be interesting to see if they can stop that Cleveland running game. What fascinates me about Cleveland, 307 rushing yards last week, even though Nick Chubb left with injury after gaining 43. Yeah, well, that's the game the plan. I'm sorry, got, Mike, Tariqo, my no, last point would be that. That would be the game plan for the Colts is to load up the box, stop, stop the run game, and force Baker Mayfield to beat you. You know, I mean, Baker, is he has definitely have the benefit of a great running attack. They, they've got, th they're deep in backs. I mean, they got obviously great wide receivers, but if you force Baker Mayfield and he drops back knowing that he can no longer run the football, I think that's the Colts. I think that's ultimately their defensive game plan. I didn't want to interrupt you guys, but Tony, when you were talking about what Matt Eberflus is doing defensively, Rodney talked about what you saw watching the Colts defense this morning. It just made me think of, what I saw when I went back and watched a little bit of the Browns Cowboys game because I want to watch Cleveland closer and the Odell Beckham touchdown when Dallas is down 41 38 325 left the onside kick they get the ball at midfield if you go back and watch that highlight watch the Dallas defenders they go to the sideline and they check out Trevon Diggs he just like stopped and Odell Beckham ran past two guys who stopped and that's the thing Tony that as we were watching here we're seeing more just simple mistakes. Look, I, I never played. Florio never played. We, we can't be critical at a certain level of what guys are doing. But when you see that kind of stuff where there's a lack of finishing a play or effort or simple stuff, that helps explain why we're getting so many points in the league because some of the basics are being left on the side of the road. They really are. I was watching that same game, Mike, and I know Rod Marinelli would be crying First yes. of all, jumping offside yes. four or five times in the course of a game, that is not called for in his defense. And then secondly, a guy runs 70 yards across the field and down the sideline and no one touches him. Nobody hustles to chase him all the way. Guys stop. Absolutely would not be tolerated. And, Coach, you summed it up. You said Sunday night, fundamental football. You give yourself a chance. At least you give yourself a chance if you line up properly, if you have the right technique, and you come up and at least try to make the tackle. You talk about Dallas, man. They're not even hustling, Mike, like you talked about. They're not playing physical. They're getting completely dominated. I thought a guy um, like Tyrone Crawford coming back from injury, I thought he was going to really be a good player for him. I thought mm -hmm. um, yeah. Griffin. I thought Griffin was going to come in and dominate and be a good player for him. These guys are getting pushed around. They, they just can't control the line of scrimmage. 
Look, the advantage for them is it's the first quarter of the season. They're one and three, and that is right up there a half game behind Philly in the division. So there's plenty of time to get it right with Dallas. Giants and Dallas play, and that's the 425 national game for a lot of folks on Sunday. And it's the 0 and 4 Giants and 1 and 3 Cowboys. And it's just lost so much luster over the last few years. Lastly, guys, our Sunday night game Minnesota 1 and 3, Seattle 4 and 0. Tony, as you have watched Russell Wilson, we talk, we know his athletic ability. We know his leadership. We know his deep ball skills. What is it about this year that it all seems to be coming together right from the very start and magnifying what he's doing on the football field? Well, I talked to their uh, quarterback coach, David Canales, and he said that in the offseason, everybody came to an agreement that this team had gone to Super Bowls. They had been great for years with a dominant defense, a run-the-ball philosophy, and then Russell Wilson making mag magical plays to, to pull games out for them. Well, Pete Carroll and everyone, Brian Schottenheimer, the offensive coordinator, everybody said, you know what, Russell Wilson's our best player now. We need to feature him. We need to uh, build the offense, build the team around him. And that's what they've done. And I think Russell has felt that confidence, and he, he's playing outstanding football. Yeah, that's a mindset, Coach, and their mindset is, you know what, we're going to put the ball in our best players' hands, and we're going to score as many points as possible. You don't go out and get D.K. Metcalf. You don't have the speed of um, Tyler Lockett and the production of um, David Moore, their third wide receiver, and, and, and not try to open up the offense. And Russell, he's doing a wonderful job. The thing that still concerns me is that defense. That defense has given up a bunch of yards. People can move the ball on that defense. And you can't expect Russell to come out and throw four or five touchdowns, especially against the better teams each week as we get closer to the playoffs. And Minnesota's a tough read. You know, they were awful the first two weeks. They've rediscovered Dalvin Cook the last two weeks. Gary Kubiak's done a good job of fixing the offense. That opens things up for Kirk Cousins. Justin Jefferson has come on strong after yeah. the first uh, two weeks that weren't great. And look, Mike Zimmer's never beaten the Seahawks. And it seems like every year now they end up playing in Seattle in primetime. They get to go out there with no fans. And that's going to be a different experience for the Vikings than it's been in the past. And so, you know, you know what's going to happen Sunday night. We're all going to pick the Seahawks and then the Vikings are going to win and the Vikings are going to let us hear about it on their Twitter page two yeah. seconds after the yeah. game ends. That's what's going to happen. Truth, truth be Mike. told, I, I was this I was this close to making the flip to the Eagles when I knew everybody was on I the was 49ers. too, Mike. I was. I just I just I just know I just know that even, even if you take the loss, it saves the grief for the entire team. You know, sometimes you have to take a sack, Tony, and just protect the yeah. rest of the team. Yeah. That may have been the moment to do that, you know? I was. Hey, I'm and I'm Rico, give you guys typically a that's you. I, I know I can I, hear I, you, Rodney. I, 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 <laughs> Good I'm going to give you guys a little heads up as you're thinking about making your pick for this week. Okay. Think about this. Think about which team is going to be able to rush the passer better. Okay. Minnesota played Green Bay early in the season. Aaron Rodgers dropped back 44 times. They didn't touch him one time. If they don't touch Russell Wilson, it's going to be sure. ugly. Yeah. Flip it over. Okay. Kirk Cousins, he's got some weaponry. And Justin Jefferson, though, they've got guys who can torch Seattle's secondary. Seattle used to be a great pass rushing team, especially right. with the noise. With no noise and no rush, if they don't get pressure on Kirk Cousins, it's going to be a long night. So my, I'm thinking about this, and I'll be thinking <laughs> about it until Sunday. Who is going to be able to rush the passer better? Well, maybe we can just score 63 to 59. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, maybe instead of a pick, I'll just take the over. Can we do yeah, that? As as I'll I'll the <laughs> take the over, right? <laughs> uh, Good chat ball with you guys. Hey, everybody stay safe. Tony, I'll see you in South Bend on Saturday. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.